negotiated with, with private companies to lower the prices of their drugs to allow, um, to make them affordable to the world's poorest. What are other market-based solutions to health problems that you've seen in action? Clearly, we've got to leverage markets because that's where well, the R&D is. You can do that in a lot of places because um, if you think about it, a lot of people who serve very poor people are providing a product or a service at low volume and somewhat uncertain payment. Therefore, they have to claim a bigger margin on what they do sell and do get paid for. So that even these generic drug uh, providers, when we began, were charging, I don't know, the, the list price was about 500 bucks a year for the, your basic first-line aid drugs. And we cut it to um, first 140, I think we got it to 135 or less now. And the whole world price structure has collapsed to within 20% of that now. So anybody, even not involved with us, can get the medicine cheaper. And then the, the uh, pediatric medicine was $600 a person, and 550,000 little kids were dying every year, and only 10,000 were getting the medicine because it was $600. Even though there were fewer component parts, the volume was so small and the money available to it so limited. And to be fair, even the global fund and the American money wasn't being used for for pediatric AIDS medicine for the simple reason that there were all these young adults dying like flies and they needed the medicine and it was less expensive. I mean, if you had to, those were the kinds of decisions that were being made. So uh, the Children's uh, Trust in England, uh, Chris and Jamie Cooper Hunt gave me enough money to double that to 10,000 more. And then we negotiated a deal with the major Indian manufacturers of the children's medicine to take it from $600 to $190 a year. And then the, the French, the, the best thing that the French government's done, I think, in my whole experience, they put this minor uh, charge on international air flights and created this fund called Unitaid and then got 19 other countries to contribute to it. And the money is used to buy medicines to deal with the problems of the poor throughout the world. So they ask our foundation to try to use a substantial allocation to deal with the pediatric drugs for the little kids, because you, it's not like an aspirin. You can't just cut adult aid medicine in half and give it to kids. They can't digest it, it won't work. And they ask us to do the second line AIDS medicine, that is get 10 to 15% of all the people being kept alive on AIDS medicine will eventually need uh, different medicine because the first will play out in its effectiveness. Anyway, we wound up getting the medicine down to $60, from 600 to $60, simply by reorganizing the market, saying we're gonna go from a low volume, high margin, uncertain payment business to a very high volume, very low margin, absolutely certain payment business. Everybody still makes money. I don't want any of these drug manufacturers to lose money. And we've gotten a lot of help, by the way, not from, from uh, mainstream pharmaceutical and other companies who helped us with the testing uh, equipment because there's no generic production of that and who are also getting interested in, in these other medicines. But essentially, you can do it right across the board. In Rwanda and Malawi, where we work with farmers, we did the same thing with fertilizer. Higher volume, lower margins, certain payment, improve the distribution chain, cut the cost of the producers and the suppliers. Uh, it's essentially what we do with uh, building retrofits and the climate change initiative in big cities. Just cut the cost of all the materials that they have to do, use to, to make the buildings more efficient by ramping the volumes way up and making sure the payment is certain. It, it's, it's, a, it's a simple little thing that philanthropy ought to be doing everywhere, just changing the business model and all of a sudden, tons more people's lives get saved. I, I was planning to ask you, Mr. President, what's new with fertilizer, but I thought that might shorten my tenure at the Aspen Institute. I just uh, wasn't so sure. Let I'll me tell you what's new with fertilizer, it costs a heck of a lot more unless it's organic because it's got so much petroleum in it. And it's another thing that's really complicating this, um, <laughs> it's complicating agriculture. And uh, you, I'll just say one thing about this food crisis. I'll make you a prediction. I think within 30 years, if not before, in every place in the world, people will be consuming a much higher percentage of food grown within 150 miles of where they live. Everywhere.
I believe that. And, um, and so I, I think, as again, I'll, I'll, I'll pat old Bob Zellick on the back. The idea that the World Bank wants to get back into f funding agricultural self-sufficiency in developing countries is very important, but we need to be looking at it in America, too. You're going to see this everywhere, I think. It'll be, it's a national security issue and an energy issue. It, and, uh, you know, it, Mr. Chertoff's got more, a lot of things to worry about, but the fact that every American sits down to a meal where the average uh, distance traveled by a lot of that food is over a thousand miles. If you really wanted to fool with America's psyche, if you tried to interrupt the food chain, it's so centralized it would be one thing you could do. I mean, there are lots of, there, there are lots of energy and other implications to this that I think will play out. So the fertilizer issue is very important and how we grow food is important. Say something about, I mean, we've got, we've got the short-term food crisis and then we've got the long-term crisis that stems from this vast increase in demand, as particularly as China and India uh, develop further. Uh, say something about the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, uh, and what its prospects are, what, whether that's an important innovation. Yeah, I think it's an important innovation. You have to be, we have to be mindful. Whenever you change the, the natural crop productivity at a given point in human history, you will both strengthen your ability to get much higher yields and make the strains more vulnerable to invasion later on. But I think that in general, we have to do whatever we can to increase agricultural productivity in Africa. I think that, look, I, I'm, I'm all for reducing the subsidies that Europe and the U.S. give to agricultural products and now's the time when the prices are high that we should be doing that. But the truth is, there are two other things we could do that would be easier to do politically that would do much more good in the next 10 years. One is to really get the show on the road trying to m replicate the results of these little Millennium Development vi Villages and the results we've had in Rwanda and Malawi in dramatically increasing productivity in Africa within each country and other poor countries as well and then removing trade barriers between these countries and their neighbors. And the second thing we should do is to change the way we deliver food aid uh, because uh, now, except in very limited circumstances, 100% of our food has to be delivered, has to be grown in America and then s delivered to the nearest port where the hunger crisis is uh, on American flagships, or at least 75% of it does. Uh, Canada stopped that a couple of years ago and started giving 50 percent of their food aid and just cash assistance to the farmers next nearest the crisis. The money goes further. It provides more food. It helps the local agricultural economy. It, it does all kinds of good. For three years, President Bush has been trying to do that with 25 percent of our aid. It's one of the few things that we <laughs> really are in complete agreement on, and we're just as, uh, and we are uh, isolated. Now, the Democrats and the Republicans just beat the living daylights out of this proposal. It's a modest proposal. Farm prices are high. It is absurd for us with all these people facing starvation in Ethiopia and, and uh, Eritrea. And we've got a lot of, you know, national security interests nearby. We've got an operation in Djibouti. We've got all this stuff going on in Somalia. You've got hunger problems in Somalia. For us to be holding on to this, when this is money already appropriated, you're not going to increase the deficit. We could send that money over there, empower farmers, make friends for America, and save lives. It's crazy for us to hold on to this old way of distributing food aid. And I see my old Secretary of Agriculture, Dan Glickman, nodding his head, and he's from Kansas. We should do this. If you want to do something really good in the short run that would help, not this year, but next year in this, write your senator or congressman of whatever party and ask him to support changing the way we distribute food aid. I, I just